Okay then, let's benchmark this fancy IEO Euring thing. I have a good feeling about this, I can't wait to see how it goes. I'll start simple by say comparing the Euring demo from the previous video to the cop command. Euring version should win easily and we can go on to more complex stuff. Ready? Huh, how about that? The Euring version is not only slightly slower, but it spends more time in the kernel. So it uses more resources and it takes more time. Pro tip, if your design adds complexity and removes performance for no benefit, then that's a sign you're not done yet. Unless you're a Silicon Valley startup. Then you can start looking for funding. We should figure out what is going wrong then. Allow me to go on a slight tangent here and explain this system time thing because it will keep coming up. The system time measures the total number of CPU seconds used by the system on behalf of the process. Basically how long the process spends in kernel space. Let's say a process starts, runs for one second, goes into kernel mode, runs there on a single kernel thread for another second, then returns and exits. That process would be reported as two seconds real time, one second user time, and another second of system time. Compare that to a process that starts, runs for one second, goes into kernel mode, then spawns three threads, which run in parallel, each for one second, then exits. That process would be reported as two real seconds, one user second, but three system seconds. That's how the time command can report a system time that is longer than the real time. In practice, processes switch between kernel and user space all the time, so the values time reports are cumulative. But you get the idea. If you saw my previous video, you'll know that IO Euring is asynchronous because it spawns kernel worker threads for the callbacks. This neatly explains why we get the time values we do. If you didn't see my previous video, then you probably should. And you should also subscribe. Where were we? Alright, looking for a way to make the Euring demo faster. Do you know what's easy and fast? Randomly changing stuff until something happens. Does it actually work? No, but let's do it anyway. My first guess will be that the buffers are not large enough, so let's increase them. See what I did there? I took a wild shot that makes me sound like I know what I'm talking about, but in reality, every I.O. workload is sensitive to buffer sizes. Here's four versions of the demo with four different page sizes. I used multiples of the file system block size, in case you're wondering. That sort of made a difference, I guess. Increasing the buffer size gives slightly better performance up to a point. But our demo still takes up two to three times its runtime in kernel land without beating the copy command. So we need to find something else to try. How about we take a look at how copy actually works? Maybe we can steal some ideas from there. The easiest thing to do is to S trace the copy command. Even though it may look complicated, there really isn't much going on. At the start, we have boilerplate executable initialization and we can skip that. Right before the main loop starts, we see an F advice hint that the file will be accessed sequentially. This lets the kernel know that the application won't be jumping around the file and won't be rereading parts, which helps with disk buffering. It also calls fstat, I assume to figure out the file size and the block size. Then we get to the bulk of the output. It's clearly a loop, which reads bytes in a buffer from the source, and then writes that buffer to the target. We can also see the buffer size the program uses is 128 kilobytes, or 32 times the block size, which is the value that had the fastest time for the demo. Actually, you know what? This seems simple enough that I bet we can write it in Rust. In fact, I already did and wrote a blog post about it as well. You can even find a link to it in the description. 
If you S trace this, you'll get a very similar result to the copy command, but more importantly, it performs the same. Excellent. Let's do the same thing now, but with Uring. Here's a schematic of the read-write version. And here's what the same structure looks like when using Uring. We'll avoid issuing parallel requests. We'll just have a basic loop doing a read and a write at a time. The important bit is that we block and wait the completion entry for every submission we do. We can spin on the CQE read or we can use a blocking submit call on the ring. The results are the same. I chose to block, but you can modify the code and see what you get. Let's see how we did. That's disappointing. It's slower than the parallel demo and takes even more system time. That's like the opposite of what we want. Maybe I should have quit while I was ahead. Or we could sample it. Make a nice flame graph, perhaps. See what happens. Let's do that. OK, here's a flame graph for the U-Ring copy. If you don't know how to read this, that's fine. I'll walk you through the highlights. But if you let me know in the comments, I could do a video on some basic measuring tools, including flame graphs. The story this graph says is that most of the time, the demo waits for IEO workers to return. That's it. About three-fourths of the samples are in kernel space, which is consistent with time measurements we saw earlier. From that, about half is doing actual work, like reading and writing data, and the rest is spent in the IEO SQ thread function, just jungling around the IEO workers that will do the actual work. So even though the code does not do parallel IEO, we still pay the cost of managing workers because that's just how IO Uring works. There is no way around it. Or is there? To be honest, I don't know, but I don't think there is. Here's a strong indication that IO Uring was never designed to be as fast as synchronous read write for sequential IO. I wrote a very simple FIO test that benchmarks sequential read and sequential write separately for vanilla read-write calls and for I.O. Uring. If I run it, the results are pretty consistent with the benchmarks we've run so far. I.O. Uring is slower than sync for this kind of workload. And you know what? That's fine. I.O. Uring was not built to solve the problem of sequential I.O. We took care of that a long time ago. Instead, it was built to be extremely efficient at the complicated stuff with async just scratching the surface of what it can do. And that's what we did here. We scratched the surface of measuring I.O. performance. But I think that's a good note to stop this video at. Thank you for watching and take care.